going to open my Bible to a passage from which I've preached many times tonight, Isaiah chapter 6. <clears throat> I desire that each one of you be blessed this night. When I was starting off years ago, and I did develop at the very same time that Brother Taylor did, though he were older than I, he had started later and I had started younger, and he and I were in a sense the product of the same movings of the Spirit, the same movements, the same thoughts, influenced by some of the same teachers, such as Walter Butler and John Wright Follett, Butler's disciples influenced me when I was 20 and 21 years old and up to about 25 or 28 or so. And at that time in life, <clears throat> being more idealistic and being subject to youthful pride, now I'm subject to middle-aged pride. <laughs> oh. Uh, it was my pride and glory in those days never to preach from a text twice. And for years, I had never, ever preached twice from the same text. Always chose a new one and preached, preached extemporaneously in an inspirational manner. And uh, I guess I was afraid that if I preached from a text twice or thrice or four times, I would be less spiritual and I would be declining somehow. So I avoided uh, preaching from texts more than once for many years, and then I, I learned something. I, I, by preaching in the same text more than once, up to 20 and 25 times, I found a possibility to discover something after 20 times that there seemed to be no possibility of discovering the first time, or the second, or the third, or the fourth. I, I likened it to peeling off layers of an onion. And also it's put in these terms in preacher's books, you can preach from a text more than once provided God renews it to you. How many would like a renewal in this room tonight? There is the possibility of renewal. Uh, my life cannot go on without periodic renewal. I must be renewed. I believe the word of the Lord is a renewing word. His mercies are new every morning. It's like the dew. I have never got tired of dew fresh bread out of the oven or going out to my grandfather's farm. There's some things I never get tired of. The classic things of life. I guess I'll never get tired of my wife because she's so marvelous. <coughs> and uh, she has been, as the Bible says and as the church has said, a renewing influence in my life and a blessing. So I'm going to open the Bible to chapter 6 of Isaiah for, I suppose, the 25th time tonight. And uh, instead of being ashamed and wretched feeling, I feel good. <laughs> for the Word of God is like an old friend. Is it not true that old friends share more deep secrets than new friends? Is that not true? And if a new friend shares too much, we recoil from them. I don't like a stranger to tell me the intimate secrets of their life. I went to the Detroit Zoo one day to take pictures of the animals with my Lycoflex and my German lights lenses. And uh, while I was spending many hours at the zoo that day, uh, a fairly short Italian gentleman encountered me who would be a little older than I am, perhaps five, six, eight years older than I. And he was there with a 350 millimeter lens photographing the animals. and. Uh, somehow we drifted together and a conversation got struck up. It turned out that he was, he is actually the world's leading photographer of church interiors today. At that time he had not yet quite achieved fame, but he would be published with his zoo pictures in the Detroit newspapers and he would have uh, special sections published of his photographs. So I thought, well, if he is what he says he is, and he didn't boast or anything, he was truly, I'd say, humble. So he could not get married until he could make more money. Uh, I thought, well, I'll spend my hours with this profession. I'll learn something. And to my horrified amazement, he poured out all of his troubles on me. 
all of the intimate things of his life until I felt real strange and creepy. <laughs> and uh, he was using me like a pastor or a psychiatrist, sort of, and even indicated he would come to my house and eat. And when I departed from him that day, he didn't teach me anything about photography. And he thanked me when we departed for teaching him about photography. And I left wondering if he was a phony. And later saw his name in the big publications and with big shows in big cities. But the fact that he <coughs> told all those things turned me off. But the Word of God has spoken to me progressively over the years. And uh, we'll just dig into Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. Hallelujah. <coughs> in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. I want to talk about uh, a teaching or two teachings from verse number one. There are two schools of thought in verse number one, and one school simply says that Isaiah was somehow related to the court in Israel, in, in Jerusalem, possibly related by the, to the king by blood, though that's not a certain fact of scholarship, and that uh, the death of the king was a kind of a release for Isaiah. And so I would say uh, on the basis of this viewpoint that God's dealings in our lives are reactionary. That is, the king dies, Isaiah is smitten with loss and sorrow, perhaps overcome by a tragic sense, perhaps his influence has lessened, and he needs a touch from God to heal the hurts and the, the injuries of having lost this great friend in the king. In that light, God's doings are reactionary. They are reactions to the things we experience in life. And I believe I've had God touch me many times to heal me uh, and to renew me after some kind of a loss. <clears throat> And I do think, uh, on the basis of the story of, of Caleb and Joshua, that many people may be waiting for something to die. God said to Caleb and Joshua, you too only of this generation shall inherit in the land, and I'm not going to take Israel until this whole generation of warriors dies, which were their peers and contemporaries in age. And so for 40 long years, uh, approximately, Caleb and Joshua waited for an unbelieving and disobedient generation to die. And I have accepted over the years that I am waiting for some things to die. Hallelujah. They will die. I will react, perhaps, by being fallen, uh, overcome by sorrow, but only after those things die are certain things possible in my life. Do you know that I know two great preachers, personal friends of mine? One is quite close, the other is not close and probably never will be. <clears throat> and those two outstanding men of God were dominated by their mothers into their 50s. And one of them told me, the one that I am close to, he said, I will never achieve a certain status until my mother dies. Because his mother is powerful. She's mighty in God. She has the grip. She has an unusual touch and operation of the Holy Ghost. And yet she, in a sense, has had a stranglehold on her son. Now, I wish my mother would live forever. And I don't believe that my mother has a stranglehold on me. She did make out of me a rather impossible perfectionist. And I'm worse than most mothers and most women by being fussy and keeping on you about details if I feel free with you. If I don't feel free with you, I'm real nice. But if I would get fairly close to you, I guarantee you I would start pressing on you much like my mother did me. And I would begin to require things if I were a, a disciple or a, a real shepherd. But my mother, I, I feel certain, does not have a stranglehold on me, and I wish my mother would live forever. I am here tonight 
and was not destroyed on a couple of occasions because my mother could function in the Holy Spirit in real might and power and effectiveness. I used to wonder, why did God anoint my mother in a miraculous way for 10 or 15 years? I wondered, and I thought, might my mother not have a great professional ministry like Catherine Kuhlman? She was much like her. <coughs> or she is much like her. And I thought, did I or and not presenting my mother to the churches as a healer and taking her around and setting up meetings? Was it my fault? I've concluded God anointed her that I might not be destroyed because she could operate in an unusual way in the spirit. Now, the way I prefer to view verse 1 of chapter 6 of Isaiah is that God's dealings in our lives are preparatory or anticipatory. And I believe that the evidence is on the side that Isaiah prophesied for part of the last year of Uzziah's reign and the Lord, foreseeing what was coming in the history of Israel and in the life of Isaiah, catches Isaiah up into the heavens and gives him a tremendous experience of a fantastic impact and prepares this man Isaiah for the things that are to come. And I like to think of my God's dealings as anticipatory, as anticipating what the devil's going to do or the evil developments in history or the pressing needs that will come in my life. I like to think of my God as foreseeing the future. And I can walk by faith into the future because I know that my God will never have me walk any place he has not walked. Hallelujah. And it is a fact that God came down in the form of Christ and walked all throughout Israel and prepared all of that place for the gospel that would come after the day of, uh, of the Pentecost. And you wonder why Peter got such results in that land and others. It is because the Son of God himself had gone and prepared the soil ahead of time. Hallelujah. God has gone before me and prepared the way. And because my natural eye doesn't see it at times, I, I have all the fears that a natural unregenerate man would have. But God sometimes catches us up in the spirit that we might have a, uh, only a preview of the future. And I believe the express purpose is to impress on us that God has that future in his hand. Glory be to God. Oh, hallelujah. As I have taught about Joseph lately and talked about Joseph's dreams, I was inspired two weeks ago to say, and I say the same thing of this vision, and this is a vision. It is an ecstasy. It is a rapture. It is an opening of the inward eye and an opening of the inward ear. And I said concerning Joseph, dreams are the seed of the future. I will say tonight that vision is the seed of the future. Praise God. And I'm addressing young people tonight in whom the call of God is in formation right now. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> For I am not a flat-footed earth dweller, but I have been in other realms besides this one. And I have seen things, not with this uh, physical instrument you see in the socket of my cranium. I have seen things not with the outward eye. Even the new heavens and the new earth. <laughs> Blessed be God. So I am leaving you with the teaching and not trying to refute that other teaching, which is good in its own place and in its own right. In fact, it's psychologically and it is more powerful. God's reactions to man's defections is a great teaching of T. Austin Sparks and the way he unfolds redemption. Every time there's a defection, God reacts. I like the way God can let things get to an awful extreme and come right into the last moment and reverse everything and bring good out of evil and out of certain defeat bring glorious victory. That is one of the chief facts of sacred history. <clears throat> yes, Isaiah saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. I, I believe that I will not dwell on elements I dwelt on before. Verse number two, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, 
and with twain he did fly. <clears throat> and one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Jehovah of hosts. <clears throat> the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. I believe that's the diffuse, filmy-looking light that we would call the Shekinah, uh, which means simply God's dwelling place, but it's a rabbinical term, and we speak of the Shekinah glory. Uh, that will be light in our story tonight. That's the light. Then said I, woe is me. For, I'm a, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, or Jehovah of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. <coughs> Excuse me. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord. I want you to notice, I'm glad that Brother Bruce Case turned to the scripture this morning, because as he preached, God quickened two of the littlest, simplest, I think, Anglo-Saxon words out of this passage to me, which were never quickened before in all my treatments of this chapter and all of my reading of commentaries and all of my meditations, of which it would be quite a few hours put together if we would add them up I've spent in this chapter. I was impressed as Bruce, Bruce read this chapter and then read a, another thing in the Old Testament which ordinarily we would not link together I was just thinking about the chain references in my Bible this morning. I thought, what if they're linked together wrong? Then what? What if they've linked the wrong scripture to scripture? And Stanley Smith has talked to me about that subject, how people link scriptures together. He feels it's a faulty way to approach God. But notice those two terms in Isaiah 6. I have seen and I have heard. I want to give you a few other biblical references on this. Can you say praise the Lord tonight? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think I'm at church. I, I liken church meetings to a blast furnace. I always imagine, <clears throat> well, fire is another thing in my sermon. I'm going to get to it later anyway. <clears throat> I characterize meetings as blast furnaces where something's being produced. But look into the uh, account in 2 Samuel 15. Part of what Bruce used this morning. And I noticed uh, two of David's powers. Uh, when Bruce preached this morning and talked about Absalom uh, revolting against David, I thought, I hope my son Stevie never revolts against me like Absalom did against David. Uh, he's like Absalom and he has very heavy hair, very thick, rich hair. He'll never get bald, I think. My father's hair came through me and got on him and I got my grandfather's through my mother. And my grandfather had many virtues. He was German, he was broad, powerful. He, he had fantastic character and authority. And he got bald at 21. He had a huge German nose with a big hump on it. He had a broad jawbone like Jack Dempsey. He was a superman, really. My grandfather was a superman. And the only thing I got from John Peter Schickling was his bald head. I didn't get his strong physique. I didn't get his jawbone. I didn't get that wonderful fatherly character. Uh, maybe a little bit of his stability came through, but I really principally got his bald head. And that's the one thing I would not have chosen from John Peter Schickling. <coughs> he was much loved by everybody. He was a kind man and he gave to the poor, though he were poor himself. He was a farmer, woodsman, coal miner, and horseman. And I, I, I count it a privilege to have lived in a 19th century environment with rail fences, no indoor bathrooms, no plumbing, no lights. And I grew up with old timers when I was young. Men that were born in 1875, some people born as early as 1850 in my neighborhood. And uh, the way as a lady in my neighborhood that saw Abraham Lincoln in the flesh. And God has privileged me to live in a 19th century context for the first uh, six, seven, eight, nine years of my life. 
I lived in that. I know other worlds. I, I'm glad for that. And the character they had will live in my heart forever. I saw people of great character. And I'm going to see them come again by, by the creative force of God. God's going to raise up mighty people in this earth. How many know that? I'm not drifting on a little island at Pinecrest not knowing where I'm going. I know something by the word of the Lord and by the Holy Ghost. And I must assert it against the corrosive forces that want to destroy this generation. I want to see the gospel have a mighty effect in this world. I want to see the dead live again. <clears throat> and sometimes it's God's will for me to assert my faith and tell what I believe and what's going to happen. And I saw, and Stevie said today, as we discussed Absalom and David, why didn't David just go and destroy him, the mighty man David? I said, now Stevie, David, David knows the Holy Spirit. He's led by God. And when you see a man like David, don't say, now David, why didn't you do so? But you watch what David's doing. See, David's being led by the Lord. The Lord is leading David, and when the Lord leads you, he often leads you down before you go up. You notice uh, Joseph in the Bible, he gets a name which means adding in Hebrew. He shall add, adding. And he gets something, this marvelous uh, king's uh, robe for a king's son, a prince's garment he gets. And then they rip it off of him and throw him into a pit. And I call this the addition that begins with subtraction. Uh, God, God may lead you down into a pit. He may let that robe, he may let you have a, a first brilliant foretaste of the anointing, the prophetic thing, that many splendor thing, and you'll wear it with, with, with confidence and with satisfaction and fulfillment, and lo and behold, it's torn from you. It is not uncommon that you will experience the anointing of God and then lose it for a season. So that God might make your character answer to your ministry. God wants the many, many colored robe internalized. Then later you can put on kingly things and sit down on the throne and rule the world. And there's no danger because he's been thoroughly processed. He's like Jesus. That's what I like about Jesus' kingdom. In the deepest sense of the word, it's humanitarian. It's, it's, see, all the other kingdoms are, have fangs and claws. They're lepers and bears and lions. And you look in the Jesus kingdom and there's a lamb in the throne. Amen. Somebody said the, li the lamb displays a finer strength than a lion. He's called the lion of Judah, but he looks like a lamb. Hallelujah. That tells us worlds of knowledge about God and God's ways. Hallelujah. And I had an insight as Bruce uh, directed us to this scripture. I saw where David's strength lay this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. David, in the first place, it is quite evident, David is taking the humble position. He's fleeing. Every time a dog challenges me, my German pride rises up and says, why, why did you submit to a dog? And if I were a German barbarian, I'd tell you the truth, I would kill every dog that ever dared to approach me. i tell you the truth. I used to go to see one of Butler's disciples and he was renting a house from a lady that had a dog that was a muscular mastiff kind of a dog, white and muscular, about this tall, very muscular. And so one of Brother Butler's disciples out of EBI who went to Bible school and Brother Wade did, has, has this house. The owner lives across the street and she's terrified of her own dog. <clears throat> and I would walk 13 miles to see this man of God. He was Pennsylvania Dutch and short. His name was Roscoe Sawyer. He married one of the presbyter's daughters, Brother Tubbs' daughter. They really met God in Bible school. They had something from God. And I'd go to his house, and this whitish dog would come over to me and challenge me, this muscular, bold, fearless dog. And he'd come over, and, uh, and he would growl at me, and he would, he would sidle up to me this way. And I'd be in the lawn, and he'd come, and I'd have to freeze there. Because the lady owns a house, and I can't do anything to the dog, because that'll wreck everything in the little town called Brisbane, where they live. 
And that dog would get right up against my leg and growl. <laughs> and I would stand there, waiting for this lady about 60, 65, 70 years old to come out with a broom, and she was terrified. <laughs> and I'm standing there, waiting for something to be done about this dog, being humbled, because I can't fall upon him, <laughs> strangle him. <laughs> One young fellow, Hated that dog so bad, he said, I shot at the dog, and he said, the bullet went under his stomach, between his legs. He said, that dog is charmed. You can't kill it. So time after time, I would encounter that dog and have to go through that humiliating ordeal. And I would be in a soul storm for hours and maybe days, and I imagine myself going to the town at night in my car and luring the dog up and grabbing the dog or, or clubbing the dog with a ball pass suddenly. But instead, I had to go out of Jerusalem. <laughs> I had to flee. <laughs> but I saw two things about David as, as I look today. It just struck me like this. Look at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 15 and verse number 27. <coughs> well, let me look at uh, 2 Samuel 15, 24, 25, 26, 27. A godly Levite called Zadok, which probably means righteous, who has a great name in sacred history. He has one of the great names. He, he faithfully served God. And it says, he and all the Levites took the ark, and they were going to go with David and take the glory with them, you see. But see, God had spoken by Moses, one place, I will choose one place. I want you to know that everything that ever happened in Israel after Moses was dependent on Moses' word. You couldn't contradict it or abrogate it or change it or break it. And David and all these men know the word of the Lord. They have, they have meditated. They have read it. They have fed upon it. It's, it's in their bloodstream. My friends, get the word of God in your yes. very bloodstream. And they're going to go with David and the king says to say, go back, take the ark back to Jerusalem. If God is with me, he'll bring me back. <clears throat> and if he doesn't delight in me, let him do as seemeth good unto him. Verse 26. And in verse 27, the king said unto Zadok the, Zadok the priest, Art not thou a seer? David had a personal friend in Jerusalem in the midst of the conspiracy who was a seer. That meant he could look out through God's eyeball. And he had the power that was divine to rightly analyze situations. I wish to God we had a seer on national TV to tell us the news. Instead of pessimistic modern nihilists or liberals. But David had supernatural eyes in Jerusalem. And then let me show you something else in the same chapter. A good man who has fame called Hushai the Archite in verse 32 <coughs> also wants to go with David. And Hushai is a wise man. Jesus promised us in Matthew 23. He said, I'm going to send you wise men. Jesus promised to personally raise up and send us wise men. I, I, I asked, where are the wise men? Send us the wise men. And this man is famous for his wisdom. And David said, you go back too. And in verse 35, what, th what things soever thou shalt hear out of the king's house, thou shalt tell it to Zadok and Abiathar the priests. <clears throat> David says, and by these young men ye shall send unto me everything that ye can hear. David had a special set of eyes in Jerusalem and a special set of ears, special powers of seeing and hearing. And may I look at a scripture that I think, in the New Testament, two scriptures and one supreme scripture. Let me look at Acts chapter 4. This is a great classic. It's a great theme around which we can build. Acts chapter 4 and verse 20. 
when Peter and John and the others were threatened with their early Christian preaching and the religious authorities attempted to silence them, Peter said, Peter and John answered and said in verse 20 of Acts 4, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Seeing and hearing in Isaiah chapter 6. His whole ministry began with seeing and hearing. Seeing the Lord. Seeing the heavenly sphere and realm. And hearing the very words of God spoken in the throne room. And there wasn't much spoken. That's something God has impressed on me. The, the littleness of the number of the words that God speaks. And yet... The staggering power these few little words contain when God says them. Do you know that one of the greatest revivals in modern times in South America began when a man sought God for three months, eight hours a day, <coughs> had much frustration, experienced much barrenness, felt the heavens were as brass, And then finally the heavens opened and he saw visions of God. But the problem is how to get the power of the vision applied to the human situation, isn't it? The fact that the problem confronting us tonight is, it confronts me at least, I confront that problem, how can I see the power that is in the gospel efficiently applied to the human predicament? And I have not stopped seeking for an answer there and I don't feel a stop coming. But when God actually spoke to him a practical word that was to be acted out, it was only this, call the people to prayer, call the people to prayer. Five words, call the people to prayer. <clears throat> and after the visions of glory he saw, he was disappointed and disillusioned. He said, how, after seeing all of his glory, could I hear a word like that? That's something I knew before. It's not even a revelation. And then he gives the secret as he penetrated it spiritually. Tom talked about penetrating this morning. He penetrated into a deeper layer of understanding. And he said, I realize it is not what is said that is important, but it is who is saying it. And it was God that said, call the people to prayer. And that resulted in a meeting where 400,000 a night gathered to hear the gospel in Argentina and the history of Argentina was changed forever. And millions heard the gospel and millions were saved and they hauled away crutches and wheelchairs and cots by tractor trailer loads. Because a man heard five simple words that really did come from the throne. And the presence of God blanketed all Argentina and the revival is a prominent feature in the state history book stating that Tommy Hicks preached to five million people face to face in 62 days, at least five million. And the final word I want to give about hearing, and this one really has the greatest of all hints that there's a wonderful kind of hearing that is so wonderful. In John 15, uh, 16 and 13, Jesus says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, <coughs> referring to the Holy Ghost, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak out from himself, but whatsoever he shall hear. There's a hearing so wonderful that even the Holy Ghost participates in it. Knowing classical Trinitarian Orthodox theology, I had to say, well, since he's the third person of the eternal Godhead, what's there for him to hear? But there is a hearing so noble and so elevated and so special that the Holy Ghost himself participates in this hearing. Never did I see that before. I think I want to hear more than ever before tonight. And there's something to be heard for God is a transmitting God. I tell you there's a message coming out from God tonight. You and I know from this knowledge of radio and TV that the air that I'm actually being pierced through by millions of messages right now. Is that right? Yeah. 
You're a radio expert, Bill. Is that true? Millions of messages are going through my body right now. I'm not hearing any of them. But if somebody brought in here a little FM or AM receiver or a multiband receiver, we could tune in dozens of scores of different messages and we would get a rational message that we could understand and it would tell us something. Something understandable, right? Messages are going through me. And I believe we can see that in Isaiah in chapter 6. I'm going to leave that idea of seeing and hearing. <clears throat> It suffice it to say there is a seeing and there is a hearing that will make you mighty in this earth. I am preparing to teach the gospel of Mark. And I've always regarded myself as a kind of a rotten teacher. And I've never really come to grips with the fullness of what teaching means. I do have a vague vision of teaching being way up in an elevated realm. I do have a bit of a vague vision for teaching in a that would be with incredible power and creativeness and life-changing reality. But the thing that is stewing in my soul about the gospel is what Peter said. He said, we have preached the gospel to you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. And I am intrigued with the combination of the gospel and the Holy Ghost and the power that would result from that. And I would advise any of you to do researches in that area, whatever that might mean. So, let me now get to a third point, major point here tonight. <clears throat> Pardon me. I notice in this uh, account that there is a fire in the throne room. He talks about a live coal, which uh, the uh, kind of angel called a seraph takes off the altar with a pair of tongs. And I've been fascinated for years with the fact that in the throne room there is a quality of fire that angels are not worthy to touch or else it is simply too intense for them. But an angel has to use tongs, but he puts it on the flesh of a man. He puts it on his mouth, on his lips. And I am fascinated with fire-touched humanity. Pardon me for raving tonight. I don't know. Why I get so high key in the pulpit? I, this is what I dreaded when I touched the Pentecostal people and I was a very reticent Anglo-Saxon. I never shouted one time when I was a fundamentalist or holiness type person. Never shouted once. And that's the way I used to say it when I was a little boy. I had an original language and dialect. I've lost it. All except I marveled at my daughter Tanya discerned that I don't say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. She said, I notice you say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And she's that sensitive to see a linguistic difference like that. But I've lost uh, all those old things. But when I, when I encountered the Pentecost, I dreaded that I might become expressive. I dreaded. I never wanted to be expressive. I wanted to be hidden. I wanted to make money and support other ministries. I wanted to, oh, I could play my violin. That would be the, of course, that's not me. That's the violin, see, so I'm not embarrassed when I play the violin. But you know, the thought came to me, and as I came in this room tonight, that some of Brother Taylor's friends have said a lot, God wants an expressive people. God, and Charles Hahn dwells on that. Now, I don't know what that means for you. <coughs> Pardon me. But God wants you to become expressive. God wants to express himself through you. And I am fascinated with fire-touched men. And tonight I was going through a catalog of who in the Bible was, was related to fire. And I think back in the Bible and I immediately remember that Moses had a tremendous experience with a fire. It was in a bush. It burned, the bush was not consumed, and it must have been a very prominent and sizable and impressive fire. It drew his attention across a considerable span of the desert. He went over to investigate it when he was 80 years old. <clears throat> Who else had experiences with fire? Elijah is associated with fire. He calls down fire on Mount Carmel, which links him with Moses and gives him Mosaic authority. Moses, the giver of the law, Elijah, the restorer of the law. You see, uh, I can't think of how many others, but I can immediately see here that Isaiah has his fire experience in chapter 6. 
And then I go to Ezekiel, and his, his book opens with a manifestation of God as amber-colored fire. Uh, Jeremiah, I don't know that he ever encountered fire outwardly. I guess he did in his vision. But he also tells us, he said, I had the word of the Lord like fire shut up in my bones. The marrow of his bones was boiling with the activity of the word of God in him. And uh, Ezekiel, having an experience of the fire, which I've already mentioned, and uh, how many other uh, prophets... I cannot say, but you find this fire motif right through the Old Testament. Holy Spirit as fire. God as a flame of fire. Uh, I think even Paul the Apostle, a late and great thinker, uh, who thinks in very different terms, says, for our God is a consuming fire. And then the book of Revelation, suddenly the last book of the Bible erupts with much fire again. Fire in many forms. And I don't know if I can verbalize it very well, but I have a revelation concerning the fire. And we ask, why is it that some people have fire and others don't have fire? What is this difference that reveals itself even in the words that they speak? But I, I see a practical application tonight and I'm going to bring in that practical application. But first of all, I want to talk about an analog I see to the New Testament here, or a certain parallel. I notice, as Brother Tom said this morning, in those most wonderful words he said after the preaching and before the communion service, I notice that before Isaiah can take up his ministry, and we are here at Pinecrest specifically, and I hope humbly and sensibly and sanely to take up our ministries, aren't we? We're here connected with ministry, and we want to have that conceived broadly and flexibly and humbly. And not to have big ideas, grandiose ideas. <clears throat> but I notice that before Isaiah can take up his ministry, he must penetrate the experience of the forgiveness of sins or free justification. His ear isn't going to hear any commission until he's cleansed from his sin. These are old and classical ideas that have incredible power. Last night I get called from Arizona by some of our Pinecrest people and talked to me almost three hours from Arizona on a Watts line. I just had a free hundred dollar phone conversation. <clears throat> and they were moaning uh, we were torn out of that setting back east, and one that I'm very familiar with, radically Pentecostal, then it changed into something else, and they, they got almost torn to pieces, almost died through it. Now they're out there on the southern low burning desert where it gets almost 130 in the summers and where there's almost nothing green. And uh, they say, we've forgotten who we are. We don't know who we are. We have no identity. And uh, then they talked about the flavor of the place they came from and the flavor that Bill Britton has and Brother Taylor's own uh, flavor and, and identity. And, and then the, the young lady who was very sharp and discerning, she said, but you know, I can't tell what flavor you are. And she, and she said that we don't have any identity. And I said, sister, you can identify with the classical things with Jesus, and the word of God and the Holy Ghost. And in the whole classic mainstream of the, Christ, the church down through the ages, I'm not sorry because I'm not locally identified and have a certain flavor like garlic or dill or basil or anything else. I don't want a special flavor. I, you know what? I like a steak. I like a steak just plainly broiled with nothing on it, not even salt. And then what I'm going to do to it, I do it. I sprinkle a little salt on it. You may put it little tab of butter. I wouldn't dream of putting steak sauce. To me, that's high blasphemy to put steak sauce on a good steak. If it's a bad one, that's all right. <laughs> but I believe Jesus would make us so wonderful, we would be wonderful as we are, not with a whole lot of overlay. You know what the benefit of the fire is? It takes so much away. And the real you comes forth, which is uh, kind of a psychological way of speaking. I didn't pity them for losing their identity. I, I gloried. <laughs> and I told her some good, strong, solid, wholesome words. 
Praise the Lord. Yes, Isaiah must penetrate justification, and I, I, I have discerned, and I have discerned, and I have discerned, and I have penetrated, I have, I realize the weakness of our movement is the weakness of the grasp of justification. I have been obsessed with my free justification. And you'll never be able to operate in the gifts and power and in liberty and in glory until you are just married to God. May I put it this way, it's not safe to become a Pentecostal before we have been a fundamentalist. <laughs> and it's not safe to be a fundamentalist or a Pentecostal if you don't have a little touch of holiness. That is, you ought to have some grasp of sanctification and a willingness to let God deal in you. <coughs> Praise the name of the Lord. I submit to you, I see many New Testament parallels. Isaiah 6 is going to close with, and this is his call, it's going to close with a great falling away predicted by God Almighty. The very being who sits on the throne is going to promise Isaiah there's going to be a great falling away in the land. And I see that the corporate, the social, can fall away even while the individual is getting mightily saved. I glory in the fact that there can be mighty conversions in an age of decline. The while the darkness is general, the fire is sharply revealed to the responsive individual. Praise God. And it, has in, it is as individuals meet the Lord in reality that the corporate thing gets straightened out. One reason the corporate is such a mess today is we have a few converted individuals trying to manage the thing with, uh, with natural powers. There's only one way to get the corporate straight, and that is to get every man, woman, boy, and girl to meet the Lord personally. Amen. Now that's a New Testament parallel I see. It would be very congruent with John's gospel and its thought. Can anybody say amen in here tonight? Amen. See, I lived in Pentecostal times and we almost starved to death without an amen. <laughs> you know, we, we think if we don't get an amen, we're utterly failing in the pulpit. I'd rather learn to go to sophisticated modern churches where an amen has never been said and may never be said. And feel real strange as you talk out into a kind of a vacuum, you know, not much feedback. <laughs> Go out of the pole and feel like I committed the unpardonable sin. <laughs> That's part of the price. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, can anybody say hallelujah here tonight? Hallelujah. Amen. Brother Butler said to us, never do that, but I, I have a perverse urge to do that at times. <laughs> Learned it from the West Texas Pentecostalists, perhaps. I don't know. But... I want to just point out in closing tonight with uh, still dealing with the fire, touched by fire. And I can go a lot of avenues. <clears throat> but Isaiah is going to have to confront a very, very discouraging reality. And I want to tell you there is an infinite difference in confronting a discouraging, sinking, negative reality just as a natural man even a genius, or even a powerful person psychologically, it is an infinite difference in confronting it humanly or confronting it having been touched by fire. Do you notice the strength of the great Bible characters was, was that they could visualize God. The Bible says Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible. Do you know that when you look at a powerful light source, like if we took one of the covers off and with that powerful bulb back there, if I stared at that incandescent bulb for a few seconds or minutes, how many of you know I would have an image of it impressed on my corneas for hours? I have stared at lights. I've even looked at the sun. And I have seen an image of that light in my mind for many hours afterwards. A bright light will form an indelible image. In fact, phot photographs are created by light striking a surface that's light sensitive. Can you carry the touch of fire into the wretched earthly environment <clears throat> and having done so, confront it in perfect confidence? Now I notice something else tonight, something that I believe the Holy Spirit 
impressed upon my mind and revealed to me. Why can a prophet confront a reality like what God says here? And when God gave Isaiah's call, he says, <clears throat> I, I quit reading it at verse 8, I heard the voice of the Lord, that's Adonai, the actual word for Lord, the main boss of the Chinese Bible. I heard the voice of the main boss saying, and that's a good translation, isn't it? That's what the Chinese Bible is, main boss Jesus, it calls him. Uh, I heard the voice of the main boss saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? You see, the justification now puts him into the realm of possibility where he can hear the voice of God. He can hear a call. It changes him so completely. He's put into the uh, heavenly transmissions, as it were, and he's able to register what the voice of God is saying. Before, he could not do that. He must first be cleansed. And God said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand it with their heart, and convert and be healed. And this... Uh, scripture is quoted by Jesus Christ in the Gospels, showing that Israel is still under this judicial word when Jesus comes into the world. And Jesus quotes this very word in the Gospels, and John the writer in the Gospel of John quotes it also. Isaiah said, Lord, <clears throat> how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man and the land be utterly desolate, and the Lord, Jehovah, that is the saving one, have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. And God says in verse 13, And yet if even a tenth survives, it also has to undergo judgment, so that like a terebinth or an oak, when they are cut down, the substance is left in the root stump, and the root stump becomes the holy seed, or as Moffat puts it, the sacred race. How many of you know that God is looking for a holy seed in these days, which is found in a remnant? Isaiah is beginning to preach a remnant doctrine by divine revelation right here at this point in his life. In fact, his first son's name is Shear Yeshub, which means a remnant is already converted. We can confront a declining situation because we know that the power of prophecy not only includes speaking a deathly word or a judgment word, a judicial word, it will cause it to sink and fail and be reduced to a root stump, but we also know, like Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones, which is an image depicting the very same kind of equality, that prophecy is also able to bring it back to life again. And I marvel when God, when Jehovah and Ezekiel talk in chapter 37, the instruction of God is merely to prophesy. God's call to me, God's instruction to me, is very simple. <clears throat> I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He's told me in no uncertain terms. He says, preach. <laughs> and sometimes when I preach, things are going to go down. But sometimes when I preach, something's going to rise again. Hallelujah. The solution is to prophesy or preach by the spirit of prophecy this uh, word in which Jesus Christ invested his life's blood and the very force that flowed in his veins is in the gospel now. And when you preach it in faith, there may be a falling, but there shall also be a rising again. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Jesus came into this world, a fire-touched man. In fact, he came right out of the fire. He was and is that fire. Confronted the barren situation. In fact, the gospel calls it the wilderness. 
A voice crying in the wilderness that began with John Baptist. And I've often wondered why did it begin in the wilderness? And God has spoken to me. Because all the world is a wilderness to God, a wilderness of sin. And because God only wants something he can plow up as a field to plant the seed of the new world in. It is said by the commentators that Jesus takes the old world eon, turns it into a plowed field, sows it with the seed of the new world eon, and the age to come springs out of the age that was. And the genius Paul says, I have converted everything I have into manure to fertilize the new creation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. How many of you now are more persuaded than ever that a creative word of God is working in you? It's in your heart. There's a seed Hallelujah. in the heart. It will surely, as God is God, produce. For the Bible says in inspired language, the word is God. God bless you all in the name of Jesus.